Hi everyone, it's Judy. Thanks for joining us again on the On Track Podcast. Today we talk with Greg Poppendrew, who just started a new company called Better Board Buying. Greg has over 27 years in the PCB sales industry, and he's gonna talk to you about tips that will help you get the most out of your vendor partnerships, help you save money and time. Lean in and enjoy, I'll see you on the other side. Welcome to All Team's On Track Podcast, where we talk to leaders about PCB design, tackling subjects ranging from schematic capture all the way to the manufacturing floor. I'm your host, Judy Warner. Please listen in every week and subscribe on iTunes, Stitcher, and all your favorite podcast apps. And be sure to check out the show notes at altium.com forward slash podcast, where you can find great resources and multiple ways to connect with us on social media. Well, hi, Greg. It's so nice to see you, my friend. Thank you for joining today. I'm excited to hear about your new venture. So thanks for joining us on the podcast today. Thank you. Great to be here. And uh, great to be back on my own again. Right? That's nice. Yes. You've had a lot so. of lives in our industry. All of them have been fun to watch. So why don't we just kick this off by um, giving our audience a little bit of your background in the industry and then talk about your latest venture, which is Better Board Buying. Well, I've been in the industry for 27 years. I started inside sales at a domestic board house, and I've always been a sales guy, customer service sales guy. In about 2002, I got a little frustrated. I felt I could customer provide better customer service for my customers and started a company called The Bear Board Group and did very well. And I sold that in 2012, and since then I've been uh, assisting other companies, whether it be in a, as an employee or consultant basis, uh, helping them get boards from offshore. But not so much getting boards from offshore, it's just getting boards from anywhere, both domestic or offshore, and what's best. But in the last few, uh, about the last year, I've been getting a little frustrated because the buyers have changed. And the... Um, there's been a new generation. You remember years mm-hmm. ago when we started, um, we didn't really have, we had Gerbers, but we had Silvers, we had prints, we had D-sized prints, which was the size mm-hmm. of a tablecloth. Yep, I used to and schlep those around. That's right, or prints were rolled up. And, uh, you know, cut and paste was literally cut and paste. You know, <laughs> taking the artwork and reshooting it, and you had diazos, and a drill tape was a drill tape that had to be fed into a, a counter. And bomb sighting. So, I I saw how the industry changed, and uh, what's happening is when I go see customers now, they're program managers and they're buyers, and sometimes they're ordering stuff not correctly or not to their best, because I walk in, and sometimes the sell is too easy because they didn't realize, oh, I could have ordered it that way, or we could have done it this way, Mm -hmm. and so it turns out that the buyers of today are not the buyers of yesterday. In fact, because we had the prints, because we had the silvers and the diazos, we, they knew what they were buying, and today they really don't know what they're buying. It's just Gerber's. Here you go. Right. Whatever yeah. it's buying, just give me a price. Yeah, it's just electronic files. It's it's all sort of this non-tangible exchange of files. Yeah, so uh, with that being said, I, I just see that there's a big disconnect as far as uh, when I talk to buyers now, my own little mini survey, and I find out that a lot of buyers, I say, how did you get started? Uh, were you trained? No, on the job training. So they just work their way up through the, comp- the corporate procurement office. And um, when years ago, we used to have commodity buyers where the fab buyer bought both anything that was physical, three-dimensional, bought boards or bought metal. Well, now the buyer, unfortunately, is buying everything from toilet paper to components to metal to fabs and sometimes they don't have enough time to really look at things and see what they're buying and it's a shame uh, you're getting things where um, uh, before you get the PCB represents 10% of the bill material that is a custom made item and you're having people who have not been trained properly to do it and if companies are ISO so this is why I came up with the idea of the better board buying is that uh, there's no real training anymore. Mm-hmm. I've always been a trainer. Uh, even with my own company, I train my people how to sell better. And when I go see customers, I train my customers on how to order better because one, I'm providing a service to them. But I'm finding more and more now when I go out in the field, there is no training. 
they don't know what they're buying or what they could be doing or how to leverage their buying power. Uh, there's a disconnect between engineers when I was working at a very large domestic board house to today where the domestic engineers are working with a uh, an inside salesperson and they're given that uh, information and then it comes time to buy, it goes to a buyer and the buyer goes to someone else, which may not be the best house right. to be building that. So I, I really do believe there is a disconnect. There's not a training involved. So that's why I want to offer is, hey, look, um, if you're an ISO company, you're training your people to do all the aspects of how to solder, how to package, how to this, how to that, or place components. Well, why aren't you training your buyers on how to bo buy boards better? And go well, in there and say, yeah. how to do this. <clears throat> well, and then, um, you and I have been, you know, I've been in the industry 25, year 27, so we've kind of had the same path. And one of the reasons why I wanted to have you on today, Greg, is I think also the face of who we're calling the buyer has changed somewhat. I mean, I think you've worked a lot with large volume and commodity, but um, this can go for the engineers and designers, and like you said, to be smarter about procuring or working with their buyers. So that's really who our audience is. And I really, my goal today in our conversations is to help give these engineers and desires. And, and some people who listen here are VPs of engineering department, and they are doing the sourcing. So to kind of take back some of that ownership and really learn from you, you know, these, these tips and tricks to really help get oh, the yes. most value for their money. So um, you you talked about some of the pain points that you see that exist and what and that drove you to start uh, Better Board Buying. What other specific things exist in the market today, specifically in today's market, and what are the type of things you want to offer as uh, Better Board Buying? Well, I think it also goes like anything, it goes both ways. Uh, there are companies that should be training their buyers and engineers how to buy boards better and what to look for. But at the same time, there are a lot of buyers that don't know the expectation they should have of their vendors because they're not getting great customer service. So true. And and I think there should be a, um, what's the word, a uh, you know, an expectation on both sides of what needs to be going on. And I don't think that I know, not think, but I do know that a lot of uh, customers I go into, it's they don't know they can get some better and they realize they're not even getting the service they should be getting and right. demanding of that. Yeah. And even with, for lack of a better word, just as the buyers have changed today, mm -hmm. well, so has the customer service has changed today. Yeah. Uh, um, whether it, what customer just, service? <laughs> well, exactly. I mean, I, I mean, I, I, I went <clears throat> to a customer the other day and um, uh, they're showing me their process and I said, well, you know, I could do this, this, and this for you. Why are you doing this? Uh, put it on me. And they go, oh, you can do that? Right. Well, yeah. And part of the reason was that today customers are not visited by their vendors and vice yeah. versa. Yeah. Vendors, I mean, they're not showing what we can do. And at the same time, customers or the buyers are not in the board houses realize what is the expectation? What are the capabilities of my board house uh, or my vendors? I, I would cringe every time I would hear a customer say, oh, I didn't know you did that. I know, and and it's like okay. So and, I'm going to tell I'm you. At, I'm looking at I'm looking like, at my rep, and I'm saying, why don't they know that? And that's the customer <laughs> service where they're not demanding. Say no, right. and both parties have to be asking questions. Right. Well, here's what I remember from back in the olden days, and I bet you had the same journey as you said. I remember driving around in my car, and it was inconvenient, but it kept us connected. Is Often I got a call on a Friday night. Someone said, I need a quick turn. I'd go pick up the silvers, the D-size drawing, all the assets to make the board. I drive it two hours to the board shop or whatever in traffic on a Friday night. I would talk directly to the cam manager, pass on everything that that designer had told me about that job, gave him the phone number of the designer. So there was all these touch points all along the way. And then the cam manager would start talking directly, you know, and if there was questions, I might be a liaison. So that there was just more touch points all along the way. And isn't it funny that technology 
um, has has kind of t- torn that all up. It's more efficient. It's time saving, but we've lost these things along the way. And um, I had a question I was going to ask you um, later, but I think I want to ask it for you now. Like, what do you think has been lost along the way? from those olden days of, you know, brick size phones and D size drawings to today and why have why have we lost it? And then I'm gonna ask you how we're gonna get it back. Yeah, really. No, it's true. <laughs> One of the places I consulted at, I was told my methods of uh, dealing with customers and that touchy feely and hands on and making sure they have everything was antiquated. <laughs> and uh, and uh, my response, no, it's time tested. In fact, I smiled when I heard that because if that's the attitude, then I will never be out of a job because it does come down to relationships. And and quite frankly, you know, when you're, I want that customer to know that, and this is what, again, teaching better board buying is that exp- if, if you're not confident in your vendor that you can call them on Friday to five o'clock in the afternoon with either a new job or I've got a problem so that it can be solved by Monday morning when he or she comes back to work. Mm -hmm. If there's that, if there's no confidence of that, well, forget about it. Then we, I mean, then you're just, you are selling price. And what I'm talking about here, even about better board buying from both the aspect of vendor, I'm not talking the cheapest price and I'm not talking about getting run over and, you know, and just pouring out money for the service. It's just that, what are you paying for and are you getting the service out of that? And if you're paying 50 cents for a board or whatever it may be for a quick turn or whatever and doesn't come in with your life, well, maybe you should have paid that dollar for it because now you're not wasting time. And at the same token, you're paying a dollar for something, but what service are you getting for that dollar? And if you can't get a hold of that person at 5 o'clock at night, then that's fine. I mean, I have customers and customers will tell you, sure, have they had problems with me? One of the biggest things I'll tell you is I'll be the first to say, if anyone tells you they're never going to have a problem, they're lying. But I will be the first one to say I'll be the fastest one to fix it. And yep. I want that confidence that they know they can get a hold of me at night mm-hmm. and say that. But most now, most customer service, at 5 o'clock, checked out, it's done. Oh, the computer will take over. I've seen, I've seen messages where everything's automated. And on the weekend, it says jobs on hold. Or late at night, jobs on hold. And it's a 24-hour turn. I said... Is the guy even reading this at night? He comes in next morning. Yeah. Jobs on hold. And it's and the email is so <clears throat> computer generated email is so cold and heartless. Well, is that what you want to be dealing with? And and from a, a vendor or a customer saying that, and as a vendor given that, is this what we give to our customers and say, Oh, you're on your own, thank you very much. Oh, maybe because we have so many customers, you're just a little, you know, you're Small fish in a very big pond, it doesn't really matter. But, you know, uh, I, I, that's where I, I really want to change things and go to customers and say, look, this is what you can demand. This is what's your expectation. Now, with being said, you have to do certain things too as well. I mean, even to a point of we have all these surveys um, and everything's being like, electronic. People don't know what's involved in making a circuit board. They don't know no, all the process. And I was going to say when you were talking, I think – that's one of the obstacles is that when you look at a circuit board as just a bomb item like a chip you know then you are going to buy on price but if it's 10 percent of the bomb cost that's a significant amount and it is custom and i think we've lost sight of that for all the reasons we've discussed so it kind of is the perfect storm right because it looks like a bomb item. <laughs> well, no, that's true. It looks like a, it looks very much like a bomb item, um, and they do shop on price. And I guess if you're looking at, you know, automotive tens of millions of pieces, but you know, it doesn't have to be the you know the ten piecer that has to be real cheap, nor the five thousand pieces a, a year. Um, the high mix, low to medium volume market is still a you know challenging market to make sure that you have an uninterrupted supply chain. And I've had customers, you know, I've lost a job for twenty cents on a thousand dollar job, a thousand piece job. It's two hundred bucks, but that two hundred dollars on a thousand pieces, at the end of the month, if that board does not come in correct or right, then th- then you as a buyer have to respond to your production and say, "Sorry, we're not going to make our month this month because of two hundred dollars." 
Right, which can and, cost tens of thousands of dollars. Oh, sure. Right, and then, yeah, it just backs up from there, and it can cost an enormous amount. It's just, uh, I feel, I, I love your message. Um, it just, I kind of get that same reaction that you get, like, oh, this is outdated. Relationships don't matter. I'm like, relationships are always going to matter. And to your point, the job security I have, or part of my job security is, maybe I'm not going out talking to one person at a time, but we have a podcast right? to bring on people like Greg, Pop and Drew. <laughs> Yeah. Right. Well, I mean, uh, we it's so it's not that it has to look it's not like we have to go backwards and do it in the old ways. Maybe we just needed to find fresh ways to engage that still provide all that value. Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, the, uh, so uh, back to my question. So what kind of services do you want to offer as part of better board buying? Well, basically, is this is uh, as far as better board buying, as far as the um, the customers concerned is basically they can call me in, I'll go in, take a look at their spend. Uh, do they have 20 vendors? Do they need 20 vendors? There's nothing wrong with having lots of vendors, but sometimes they're not. Sometimes uh, customers are not leveraging their spend. They realize they could we could group things together and get a little bit more buying power. Um, is, do I have a delivered price quoted? Some customers feel like we'll take care of the freight. Well, sometimes there's a lot of hidden costs that you don't realize that mm -hmm. you're actually spending more money on freight, uh, one thing I've always said for years: I hate making UPS richer than they already are. Right. You know, you know, there's ways to negotiate better pricing with that, where you can negotiate a deliver price. You don't have to worry about different things like that. Uh, is there consignment? Um, you know, how often do we run this part? Can I quote it quarterly, but accept monthly deliveries? Can I keep things on my shelf and just pay as I pull? I mean, there are times where you know I go collect the money from a customer and I say, "Hey, it's ten thousand pieces here." And I said, wait a second, you can't assemble 10,000 pieces at one time. No, we bought this because we thought we'd get a better price. Well, what if I gave you 10,000 pieces and I split it over three or four months as you assemble them and pay me because now you don't have as big as a bill as before. Right. And these are the kind of things that they're not thinking about. So I can actually go into a um, any kind, either OEM or contract manufacturer, take a look at their spend and say, this is who you need to use. This is how you should ask. Keep this guy. This guy's not doing any favors. Uh, do you have even one thing is amazing is that we oh okay we have an NDA in place, uh, we have a capability sheet, we need a facilities listing, but one thing that customers don't do, which I notice, is we don't have a what do we do if something were to happen plan in place. There's an expectation. In other words, everything's going to be rosy, but we know things are going to happen, so we do. So we don't want anyone panicking. Okay. No one has died from a circuit board being late that I know of, okay? <laughs> no one has died that I've known. So, okay, so if we know that, but what do we do to resolve that issue? And I, I've actually been told several times, Greg, I've never had anyone talk about the end before the beginning. Well, you have to. So if, if there's going to be a problem, here's the procedure and how we do this. Right. And, and if you'd say, so if you got a problem, i got to know a date code. <laughs> I've got to know how many pieces are affected. I've got to know this, that, the other, clarity, pictures, photos. Let me know what it is because if it's offshore, you know, here in my time in four hours, my offices are waking up, you know, or um, so I can get to a resolution to you by midnight your time or the next morning. But these are the things where if it's an offshore or even domestic where, you know, if I as a buyer, a professional board buyer, maybe that's the name of the course of PBB, <laughs> is to go ahead and say, and that's another thing is, uh, not only from a company standpoint, for from an individual standpoint, that you can actually, you've been trained, because there is no training. But, um, and that's what I would offer you to the individuals, would be an actual training program, where to say, hey, look, I've gone through this, I know what's the expectation, I know what to do, and how to look at different things, and I bring an expertise to my next job, or I bring an expertise to keep me at my job. Well, I'd like prior. to see you again because I'm sitting in the corner of the engineers and designers here. I would challenge you to include those folks because, you know, I've mostly done prototype, pre-production, low-volume production over the course of my career. And usually the engineers were driving the buying decisions. And I don't... I know that in most cases they don't get this information to work collabor collaboratively 
with their buyers, right? And to make sure it doesn't get just thrown over the fence. And, and as you mentioned before, the buyer may just pick another vendor, right? Um, right. So, well, and they and, and that's that's <clears throat> fine because they might have a relationship, and maybe that salesperson of that board house fine. But is there something you miss because the engineer who starts everything has got a relationship with someone? Right. How do we make this work? Right. And you know, and, and there might be some corporate dictate that you go with this one person, but you have an engineer who finds something that's a value to the company. And I think there's nothing wrong with both the engineering and the person coming together and saying, "This is how we buy boards." Right. And this is what we look at. And maybe, you know, and maybe there's rules uh, that they have. A, okay, look, this is pre-production. What the engineer says goes. But after everything's been blessed, it goes to purchasing and we take over from there. Right. And and is there a delineation? Uh, I just sometimes, I don't see that as much. I see some things heavily engineering, heavily engineering, which is great. And and as for me, as for a, um, if I was a salesperson, uh, which I am, but uh, if I was in there, I would say, this is great. I'm going to just take care of the engineers and be damn with, uh, with, uh, with buyers because, hey, engineers said this, good or bad. And that may not be healthy for a company. Well, I can and think it, of a specific um, time that I went, I was calling on SpaceX to a group of RF engineers there. And mm -hmm. the way that I chose to handle that is... I got called in by the RF engineers because it was a specialty type of board and I don't think they had one on their AVL that was going to meet their needs. So the engineers called me in, but I want to make sure that the buyer didn't feel like I was doing an end run. Sure. And being crappy about it. So I called up the buyer and I mm -hmm. let her know I'm having this meeting. You know, I welcome you to join and give your input, and I'd like to know what you know and to work together. And that worked beautifully. Where, and in that meeting, she basically handed the keys over to the RF. Like, I get what you need is different than our standard, you know, vendors on our AVL. And so we work together collaboratively. And so I think that's the kind of thing I'm talking about. Is well, actually, that is actually that was a very good sales thing that you did. Well, because you include everyone and you got buy-in, right? And that's and th and that is the thing is uh, sometimes I see departments fight against each other. There's yeah, not a buy -in. yeah. I mean, it's and there's nothing can, wrong it, with standing your ground with uh, what you feel is the best interest of the company, but you could come together and talk. Where some people they're just not even talking. Yeah. And you know whether it's personalized and some things will never get in, but I would say bravo as a when one salesperson or another, that's the way to do it. Well, yeah, and and so in that case. She basically told the engineers in the meeting, in my presence, whatever you guys need, just keep me in the loop. There you know, you so she could do her job. She wouldn't get tripped up. Mm -hmm. um, and she did have expertise that they didn't have. And so, anyways, because sure. it, it, here's how it could have gone. And I'm sure you've seen this before, Greg, is it could have gone that, that oh, tricky me, I got in to see some RF engineers. I got them to buy in and, and you know, f force her hand to put me on the AVL. And then there is, like, resentment and disconnect and cause more discord, actually, inside that organization. That's not good. Long term, it's not good for me no. or anybody, right? Sure. So, anyways... Uh, so, and I know, like I said, you've done much more very large scale production. So, you know, stuff I've done is small peanuts compared well, no, to but, what but, you've but done. It's, but quite frankly, though, the amount of work that goes in a 500 piece order or $5 million piece order is just as much. Kind of. So the thing is, uh, the principles still stay the same. Yeah. Um, so, okay. Interesting. You, you that's know, a good point. Um, you know, so it's good. You said something that I want to hear uh, more from you about. Um, I wrote myself a note here. Let me find it. Um, you said something about sort of, it reminds me, I think it was Wayne Dyer that said, begin with the end in mind. So I've heard some people talk about, you know, just quick and dirty prototypes, which I kind of personally hate that term because they are quick and dirty and then you typically have to go into a respin or something um, what say you regarding how an engineer or buyer should think about a prototype 
Um, and what does it mean to you to begin with the end in mind? Okay. Um, first and foremost, uh, first question is how many pieces are we talking about? Um, if it's just a test board, okay, we're talking a test board. You know, is this eventually going to become a product line? Yes, there's got to be some thought. Okay, how will this be manufactured? The reason why I say that, if it's a test board or one off, or we're just building this to see, okay, well, whatever you want. I can, one piece, most board houses, we can make a board stand on edge for one piece. But now you want 500 to 1,000 of these over a year's time, that's different. So there's got to be some thought where I say, okay, um, as an engineer, going to production, Okay, how are we going to assemble this, guys? If I was to do this, and this is where the collaboration comes with internally, where you could say, okay, I'm going to be building this. Are you going to have a problem? What would be a good way to put this in an array? Because sometimes even I will do that with production, where I'll call the production manager and say, hey, uh, and then again, I do have a relationship with them, where I can actually say to them, hey, look, I got this project here. You're going to have a problem with this because I don't want boards coming back because from a customer service standpoint, I want to make sure what they get works and works in the system because I don't want to go, hey, I just built what your engineer told me to build. <laughs> Have a nice day. Right. I still get bad mouth no matter what. Oh, yeah, those boards we got from Greg didn't work. Well, yeah, but that wasn't my fault. They don't want to hear that. Right. You know, and so, you know, and that unfortunately is this uh, double edged sword where uh, another big complaint is, you know, from a, and this is what I will be helping is that I've heard complaints, oh yeah, your company asks too many questions. Okay. Really? <laughs> yeah, okay, well, <laughs> you know, I said, have you had a problem with my boards? No, we haven't. Okay, well, there's a reason. Now, maybe the package is not complete. Maybe I don't have a, a lot of companies don't have, which is interesting. I'll ask, do you have your um, corporate specs for PCBs? Oh yeah, let's talk yeah. about that too. And then they, they say they don't have it. Well, I can help them write up corporate specs that are reasonable, nothing too detailed, but just say, hey, this is the basics we need for corporate. So if you give that to your board house, that should cut down on 80% of the questions um, and leave that 20 to something that's involved. Right. Uh, and that's part of the customer service that, you know, a lot of places, there's only one point of contact, not a bunch. I've had people complain that there are too many points of contact. Yes and no. I'm, I want to get, you know, you want to show to your customer that there is depth and robustness to your company. Same with, you know, you as the customer. You're not available. You're on vacation. Does everything stop when you're gone? Mm -hmm. You know, and that happens on both sides. So from a customer spec standpoint, you know, laying the groundwork down, this is what we have to do all the time for your boards, for 90% of the boards, and anything outside of that, ask the question. But a lot of people, they're afraid to do that. Or they're, you know, I also want to make it very easy where a customer, a person who buys board, whether it be an engineer, buyer, buying, whatever, can actually move to another vendor with confidence and not worry. Sometimes uh, there are a lot of cases where engineers, oh, we've been using them for years. Okay, well, there's a lot of companies that will take a credit card over the phone, you know, or online right. with the computer. You know, give them a try. You know, if anything, don't put all your eggs in one basket. Um, you know, I think a lot of it is they, today's buyers or engineers don't know that they can do that very easily, but because they walked into something, this is who we buy from. You know, and yeah. if it's not given that service. So, from a, a spec standpoint to questions, to ask those questions, uh, that is all part of the things where what is their process internally? And they're, now, you know, these are a lot of companies, they're not doing that properly at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so why do you think we've lost this why? Where's the why? Why have we lost this? Besides the physical good part that we already covered, what? I think it's like anything else. I mean, I wrote a column a year or so ago, we're all the young bloods. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't think there are people who are interested in manufacturing like they used to be. Mm -hmm. I, uh, people are, are getting jobs um, who were in buying, but they were not in boards. Uh, they might be in corporate buying and supply chain management, but really it could be in a totally different uh, field, even, you know, retail. Mm -hmm. And now they come to this where a lot of different parts have to come together. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't. I think we lack that expertise, and I think we lack that training. Mm -hmm. 
I, I, and that's where, for lack of a better word, better board buying comes in play because there's no more training for it. I, I you know. Um, Are you writing regular columns now, Greg? Yes, I'm starting that right now. There'll be one coming out in June, but you'll see regular columns every two months. Okay, will uh, you make sure and, and, and share Oh yeah, of uh, course. Where we where our listeners can find those because I'm sure you know they'd like to learn more from you. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's a little bit of the why, you know. Just and we talked about electronics, t- file transfer, all of that. Um, we've talked a little bit um, about what you like to do about it, which I think is really great. Um, what um, what no- do you think? It's going to take you personally. What do you think it's going to take to turn this trend around? Because what I hear you saying is you really want to impact. Sure. Well, you know, this. It's, you're, it's you're a- going to see a lot of postings, whether um, I've got over almost 4,000 connections on LinkedIn. Uh, I've, wherever a customer I've had, I've linked with. People I know in the industry or know of or heard of, they're on LinkedIn with. Um, you'll see me at PCB West, you'll see me at SMTA, IPC, you'll see me involved in talking with different people, speaking at different events as well. So between the columns, between putting out my content marketing on LinkedIn, uh, between word of mouth of uh, being hired by customers, that's what I'm going to be doing. That's exciting. You know, was, well, I'm excited no, for you because I, I do see this. I don't see it like you see it anymore because I've been out of the sales game for a while. But I really see that it's sorely needed. And to your point about data packages and not getting clarity up front, um, I was talking to Jerry Partita from Summit, and he was saying, you know, something like over 60% of the jobs they get go on hold like almost immediately. And it's just because those things aren't clarified up front, right? Which it's, right. It, 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 they lose a lot of time. So besides um, connecting with you uh, and better board buying, what are ways would, that you would suggest that whether they be a buyer, an engineer, anyone that's part of the buying process, what kind of things can they do to sort of self-educate besides oh, connecting well, with that, your company? Yeah, no, no, there's plenty out there for from industry, whether it's um, from what you have on um, on track, which I've, I've gone through, and you have a lot of great information there. Um, circuits assembly, PCB 007, going to shows, uh, trade shows, going to trade shows, talking to different people there about boards and seeing them. You might find, because of the relationship, you might find someone that you like. Okay, yes, this other board house looks nice and all that, but this guy I like, I like dealing with. Uh, just get out there and uh, read as many as, as you possibly can about boards. There's so much information out there. And I think, you know, there's always about sales training and there's always about technology, but there's nothing anything that's telling people how to buy it. Right. You know, it's, and that's yeah, a, which is and really great. Like, and, and it's so funny. Great. Could you imagine 20 years ago saying, yeah, 20 years from now, I'm going to have a I'm going to be a consultant teaching people how to buy boards. I mean, it, <laughs> the world well, has changed. Actually, you know. Well, actually, but I mean, not that we couldn't have used it 20 years ago. It's just the world's really changed. Well, the thing is, was funny was, um, you know, 10 years ago, I was thinking about, you know, what would I do when I, if and when I retire? And I actually thought I would teach people how. I actually said to myself, oh. I'll teach them how to buy boards because the thing is, it was like I walked in there and it was like, this is not that hard, you know, and they just don't know. It's a skill. And, it's an it's and, a skill that you can acquire, which is an exciting thing. Um, oh, you just made me think of something. Oh, you and I were talking on the phone yesterday. One thing I wanted to ask you is what things in a board design can contribute to sticker shock once a oh. board does go to production? Oh my gosh, there's so many. I, I okay, like just one, give us a handful because I know you have bumped your okay. head against this one a bunch yeah. of times. Uh, uh, first of all, okay, um, unless it needs um, one of the biggest thing is clarity on you know is it a one ounce finish or one ounce start? Uh, that makes a difference there. You know how many, and this comes back to the spec. How much copper you want in the hole? I know some things where a customer will, you know, depending on the engineer, will design. I used to say design an Oldsmobile, uh, but now, but you know, instead of design, design a Ford 
or a Honda. Don't design a Porsche. And mm-hmm. there's some cases where I'll say, why are we doing this on this design? Again, I'm asking a question. I go, well, I said, this does it really need to be this high tech, this board? It seems pretty simple. Well, what do you mean? I said, why do we have all these fine lines and small holes, I mean, on this board? And so they're designing a Porsche when a Ford will get you there just as well. And that's where it has to be some thought where down the line. Uh, you know, you get what you pay for, and some customers will do that. So I would say copper weight, board thickness, um, how many up on an array? Uh, do we have lots of routing or score? Uh, Why you know, would uh, routing or score impact price? Well, it, well, there is time involved when you're uh, fabbing or what they call the final fabrication when you're separating the board. If it's a square-shaped board, you know, you could sco- score quite a bit of that and save time as far as uh, plunge time for a router. Um, there's lots of different things where sometimes uh, the different shapes of a board does it have to be uniquely shaped a certain way. Calling for a, a smaller router bit than necessary, okay, if you have to, because I can't stack as many as high as I can if I use an 093 bit, but if I have an 062 or 031 bit because it's something unique, you know, unless it's design specific, okay, fine, but when we go to production, we may want to look at a punch, uh, things like that where it makes it easier to, to replicate this all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, solder, mass, so, solder mass thickness, um, controlled impedance, uh, depending on what you need. Um, Things that just make things harder than it actually needs to be. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Um, also explaining with your vendor um, what's going on and asking those questions at the time of design. Hey, if I did this, what would you recommend? Because a lot of board houses out there do have engineers, board designers. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember I had one board that was um, a combination of a power board and a control board. And so we had a lot of heavy copper. They wanted two mils of copper in the hole. And I said, why do you want this? Well, because the power. Well, I took it to a friend of mine who designed circuit boards. And he says, oh, I know what they're trying to do here. And he saw, because you want to have transfer of heat and all that, he saw what they were doing. He says, now, Greg, if we put 19 more via holes in this board, these locations, we go down to one ounce of copper in the hole, one mil of copper in the hole. And I, went to the, and I went to the customer and said, here it is, and we'll never be late again, and your price is this, and you won't have a problem. And they go, oh, wow. You know, so those are the kind of things where, you know, I, it, sometimes we don't want to design cost in. Right. And, and, we, and the, obviously we do that inadvertently, right? And yes. we tend to, you know, err on the side of caution and possibly over-design to ensure right. success. But sometimes I can really bite you um, once you go sure. to production, you know, price wise or labor wise, and it's just these unintended consequences. Sure. Well, we're wrapping up now, Greg, but right. thank you so much. And I really, oh, really pleasure. appreciate your um, old fashioned, <laughs> solid customer service. Um, you know, beginning with the end in mind, you know, I feel like we don't have enough of this in the, in our industry today. So I really appreciate the service that you've given. And, right. and it's a testament to why you've survived all these years in a, in a challenging industry. So congratulations sure. on Better Board Buying. And we'll look forward to how you do and we'll check in later. Now, I used to do this thing um, occasionally uh, on the On Track podcast. I want to do it with you. And I didn't give you any warning, but I just decided okay. I want to do this this morning. All right. So I have this thing called Designers After Art. Even though you're not a designer, yeah. you have um, a really noble and cool thing that you've been involved with for many, many years. And that is the Boy Scouts of America. Sure. Can you tell us a little bit about your involvement in Boy Scouts and what – how you got there and and what oh. drives that passion? Um, I, owe, I always say this. Um, I owe half my success to my wife, the other half to being an Eagle Scout. And my wife will debate about percentages. But <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a, it's a great organization um, for the youth in this, uh, in this country, both male and female now, which I'm a big proponent of that. I'm an Eagle Scout. My son's an Eagle Scout. Um, I'm still very much involved in Scouts, even though my son is 27 and out of the house. Uh, I used to be the council president here. I take kids to New Mexico to hike in the backcountry every two or three years. 
Uh, it's life-changing experiences. It teaches a young man or woman how to be self-sufficient, how to think. And um, it's one of those things, whether it's being, you learn about what it is to be a, a good steward of the environment and also how to be a good citizen. Mm. Um, and that's what I like about it. And so there's a lot of things that scouting will teach that we may not learn at home or learn at school. And um, I, like I said, I'm very passionate about that. I, I, yeah, here, even a Boy Scout mug. So there you go. <laughs> drinking my coffee. So, uh, no, thanks for allowing me to share that, but I, I enjoy that quite a bit. Yeah. Uh, I, I go camping once a month with them. And um, if I can help, then I, can, then I do help with it. So That's thanks for asking. Great. Yeah, my pleasure. Well, I think it's, um, there's folks in our industry, and you don't always get to see the interesting you know, side interests or hobbies they do, but it's been my observation that the people that endure in this industry usually have either neat hobbies or side passions, and, and I would include, include you in that company. And uh, oh, most people who know you well at all know your passion for your Boy Scouts, so I, I That's true. appreciate you carrying that flag. I think <laughs> it's a, a noble thing and um, teaches a lot of character, which is a great thing, so... Thanks so much well, thank, for that. Thank you. Well, Greg, thanks again for, for sharing all your knowledge and wisdom. Please uh, share with me all your articles or resources so our listeners can continue to follow you and learn more about Better Board Buying. We wish you all the success well, in the you. world. And thanks for joining us today. And thank you to our listeners for listening to the On Track podcast today. Remember to like, subscribe, and comment. Um, we are always looking for your input on what kind of things you would like to learn about. So until next time, always stay on track.